In August 2009, he told author Lisa McCubbin, quote, I do not talk ever about that date. He also told Lisa, I never, never will write a book. <laughs> but many discussions followed their first meeting. Clint learned that he could trust Lisa with stories that he had never told before. Writing together became therapeutic for both of them. They have now written and published three bestsellers. In their writing and in their travels, they also found each other. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lisa McCubbin and a genuine American hero of mine, Clint Hill. Please. His mother already had five children, and she realized she could not care for him properly. So she had him baptized, and when he was 17 days old, she dropped him off at the North Dakota Children's Home in Fargo, North Dakota. Luckily for Clint, when he was three months old, a wonderful family, Chris and Jenny Hill, adopted him. They also had a, a daughter, Janice, that they had adopted. And he grew up in the small town of Washburn, North Dakota, in this home, population 912. Clint, growing up in this tiny town in North Dakota, did you always think that you wanted to be a Secret Service agent? No, not at all. No, no. My goal was to become a history teacher. I majored in history and physical education and minored in education, so I wanted to teach history and coach athletics. But I graduated from college right at the end of the Korean War, and so I had to go into the military. After basic training, they sent me to Fort Holliver, Maryland, the Army Intelligence Center, and they trained me to be a special agent in counterintelligence. And I did that for a number of years. It was time to get out. I was looking around for an organization that would have a similar investigative background as the Secret Service. I, that's the uh, Counterintelligence Corps, and I found the Secret Service, which at that time had only 269 agents in the entire organization, and so there were no openings. But a man retired, and I finally got that job, and I started out in Denver, Colorado. So he had only been in the Secret <laughs> Service for less than a year, and he was transferred to the elite White House presidential protective detail. President Eisenhower was. Um, the president at the time, and this is Clint standing in the doorway there, that was back when they wore hats. And uh, so what was it like working for President Eisenhower? Well, you know, he was a military man, so he brought that military bearing right with him into the Oval Office. If you gave him a schedule and told him that he had to, leave, he had to be 
departing the White House at 9.30 a.m. At 9.29.30, he was in the car ready to go. <laughs> he was, uh, he relied on us a great deal, but we were not his favorite people, and he wouldn't call us by name. He would simply treat us like he treated the troops. He'd just say, hey, agent, and we would respond. But we had a great deal of respect for him, and we enjoyed working with him a great deal. And shortly after you were assigned to this detail, I think it was only about a month, you got to go on quite a trip. It was your first overseas trip ever. Yes, and uh, the Air Force had just acquired three 707 jets, made them available, so President Eisenhower decided to take advantage of it, so one day we took off, man, his Air Force base. Flew to Rome, Italy, rolled to Ankara, Anchor down to uh, Karachi, Karachi up to uh, to Kabul, Kabul down to uh, New Delhi, New Delhi over to Tehran, Tehran to Athens, grabbed the USS Des Moines and took, went across the Mediterranean to Tunis, got back on the Des Moines, went over to Toulon, France, took a train to Paris, got back on Air Force One, flew down to Madrid to see General Mo Franco, and then flew down to see the King of Morocco, and then we were able to come home. <laughs> that was your first trip? <laughs> it was my first trip for a kid in North Dakota. That was quite an adventure. <laughs> and you can see from all these photos, they had open cars wherever they went, and crowds everywhere. And then, Clint, you were um, given a particular assignment during the election of 1960. In 1960, when Nixon was running against Kennedy, and I was working, I was assigned to President Eisenhower, and he hadn't done much for the Nixon campaign in that year, so in the very end of the campaign, he decided he needed to do something, so he decided he wanted to go to New York. So they sent an advance crew to New York, Stu Knight, Harvey Henderson, Paul Rundle, and myself, I was the junior agent. And we each had our own assignments. Mine was the motorcade up from the helic port, at Wall Street, up through the canyons to Herald Square, and on to the Waldorf. And this is what you saw as you proceeded. The Vice President and the President, both in the same open car, going up the canyons of New York City at noon. It was a mess. And I was scared to death. But thank God for the New York Police and the New York City Field Office we made it okay. So then in 1960, John F. Kennedy was elected president, <coughs> and that was quite a transition. Yes, we went from a 70-year-old grandfather to a 43-year-old father <coughs> and just a three-year-old girl, a 31-year-old wife who was very, very pregnant. And so we knew the activity <coughs> level was going to be completely different. So now normally, um, Clinton had been assigned to the president, and now with a new president, you assumed you were going to be assigned to John F. Kennedy, but that's not how it happened. Not at all. I was with President Eisenhower down at Augusta National, down at the day after the election, and they told me I had to go back to Washington because the chief wanted to see me. So I went in to see the chief. I thought maybe I'd done something wrong. They sat me down. It was the chief, the deputy chief, and three inspectors, and they started to interrogate me going over my entire background about uh, that they had already investigated. They knew exactly what was in my background. But it took about 90 minutes, and they finally came to me and said, okay, you're being assigned to Mrs. John F. Kennedy. So how did you feel about that? I was angry, disappointed, disgusted, mad. I didn't want that job because I knew what the agents with best Truman and Mamie Eisenhower did. They went to fashion shows, watched Canasta games. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be where the action was. And that was always with the president. But as it turned out, he had the best assignment in all of the Secret Service, being assigned to Jacqueline Kennedy. Yes, we went everywhere. Here they are coming out of church up in Cape Cod. That's, this is Kennedy, the president. And this is going into uh, the church service. You can see the crowd that was there. No matter where we went with them, it was a maximum crowd situation. Crowd control became a major problem. And so you got to know the president very well also, and you spent a lot of time up in Hyannisport with them. We did. They had a regular schedule. They would go to Hyannisport for the summer, 
usually for at least the 4th of July up to Labor Day, then go down to Newport, Newport Rhode Island to Mrs. Kennedy's <coughs> mother's home for a few days, come back there on Thanksgiving. In the winter times, they would spend <coughs> Christmas, New Year's, and Easter in Palm Beach, Florida. But here is a typical situation. The president has arrived. He has flown in over to the Kennedy compound from Otis Air Force Base, where he landed in Air Force One. He's going over by helicopter. We put this golf cart out for him. He'd get off the, air, the helicopter and walk out and get on the golf course and yell out, anybody for ice cream? And all of his nephews and nieces <laughs> and Caroline and John would come running, get on board. It's two blocks away to the ice cream store and he'd have to put the bill. <laughs> but you were around presidents all the time and even when they're on vacation, they're really not on vacation. No, this is typical. This is up on the Cape. Everybody's having a good time. The family's but the president's in the background, you see there on the phone, and that was very typical of any president, this one included. They're never really off. There's always something going on somewhere that they're involved in. Here he is on the phone. Can't even be talking to his family. So, Clint, you got very close to <coughs> Mrs. Kennedy, and she trusted you implicitly over those years. And um, sometimes she would ask you to do things that were a little bit outside the job description of a Secret Service agent. Way outside. <laughs> they went to Florida one weekend in February of 1963. And uh, when we got there, Mrs. Kenny indicated to me that she and the president were going to go to a friend's house for dinner. So I left my assistant there, Paul Landis. I went to the motel we stayed in. Uh, about 8 o'clock at night, I was sitting on the edge of my bed in my shorts and t-shirt, and the phone rang. It was Mrs. Kennedy. She said, oh, Mr. Hill, the president and I would like to have you do something for us. I said, fine man, what's that? She said, well, you know, Prince Radzi was here, that was her brother-in-law, and Chuck Spaulding, that was the president's closest friend. And they're going to go on a little hike, and occasionally the president and I are going to go out and check on them, and we know the Secret Service is going to have to have somebody out there when we do that, and we think that should be you. I said, fine, ma'am, about when do they want to start? She said, oh, about midnight. I said, fine, ma'am, I'll be right there. So I hung up, sat back in the bed and said, no, what the heck am I going to wear to go on this little hike? Now wait, how long was this little hike? 50 miles. <laughs> so I had a pair of four-shine shoes that were pretty sturdy. We had dress wingtips, so that's what I put on. Drove over, picked up the prince and Chuck Spaulding, and away we went. Started walking down what was a newly constructed Sunshine Highway. There you see the prince out there in front on the right. That's me in the dark behind him. This is Kennedy's sister, Lee. Chuck Spaulding's a tall gentleman, and Mrs. Kennedy checking us out. Then the president would stop by. There you see the two men are resting. The president is actually giving me a bad time because I've allowed them to rest. What I didn't know was that there was a wager involved. The president had bet them they could not go 50 miles. They bet him they could. The president didn't want me to allow them to rest. He wanted me to make them walk continuously so they couldn't make it. But we made it. Got to the end of the 50 miles. Put him in the car, drove back to Palm Beach. I was so anxious to get back to the motel, do a hot shower and a bed. Got there, the agent said, the president wants to see you. I thought, oh, not again. So I went in, and they were having a little party. And the president and Mrs. Kennedy had prepared a little medal out of construction paper with a chain made out of crepe paper to hang around my neck. And it said, for Dazzle. That was my code name, Dazzle. February 23, 1963, the order of the pacemaker, <laughs> he whom the Secret Service will follow into the battle of the Sunshine Highway, signed John F. Kennedy. And Clint still has that as one of his prized possessions. So we want to give you an idea of what it was like for these agents back then to protect presidents when they traveled. Um, Clint, how many agents were on the detail at that time? There were 40 agents total, three assigned to the two children, 
two of them was assigned to the First Lady, five assigned to the Transportation Section, and 30 assigned to the President. That was three shifts of 10. But on each shift, there were a certain number of agents who were on either annual leave, sick leave, or on advance assignment. So that, generally speaking, left only five agents with the President at any one time. Here we are in Dublin, Ireland. You can see the crowds, people hanging out of windows, on balconies, on top of it, buildings, any place they could get to see the president. This is in Costa Rica. Had to call the military out to get the president to the crowd. It was so dense. Then we went into uh, Mexico City. You know, Mexico City sits up around 9,000 feet. But that's not snow. That's confetti. <laughs> There was so much confetti that it filled up the open car we were using, which was the Mexican president's car, filled it up right to the top of the seats. And this is the Ich bin ein Berliner speech site in Berlin. President Kennedy made that famous speech, Ich bin ein Berliner. Thousands of people on top of buildings, on balconies, open windows, every place that they could be. And we had a limited number of agents around the president. Five to 10 Secret Service agents protecting the president. And there were no magnetometers at that time. So Clint, how did the trip to Texas, why did that come about? Well, President Kennedy met with Vice President Johnson and Governor Connolly in El Paso in the spring of 1960. <coughs> they decided that in order to win the election in 1964, they needed to carry the two biggest states in the South with the most electoral votes, Florida and Texas. <coughs> and so they decided that Kennedy was going to Florida, which he did the weekend of November 16, 17, and 18. And then he would come to Texas and be joined by Vice President Mrs. Johnson and Governor Connolly and his wife Nellie. And they would travel throughout Texas. And they wanted it to be a maximum exposure trip so that as many people as possible could see if the Kennedys with the Vice President and the Governor, Mrs. Connolly, and uh, they wanted it to be an up close and personal visit. We had flown this car, SS-100X, from Washington to San Antonio, which was our first stop. This is at San Antonio International Airport. You see the people on top of the terminal. The inside of the terminal was absolutely packed with people as well as we prepared for the motorcade there in San Antonio. We traveled through the streets of San Antonio on our way to the uh, Brooks Medical Facility, which was being dedicated that day as an aerospace medical facility. And President Kennedy was to give a speech. You see him here speaking. And on the platform, you see Vice President Johnson off to the right next to Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Johnson, and then Governor Connolly and Mrs. Connolly and Senator Yarrow. They were all there to dedicate this facility. So we finished that, drove out to uh, Cali Field where they moved Air Force One to give the motorcade a longer journey through the city for more people. And we went from San Antonio to, uh, to Houston. Got to Houston and there was a large crowd there. And President and Mrs. Kennedy went immediately to them to shake hands. It was very typical of him, but not very typical of her. We then got on the interstate or the highway there in Houston to go into downtown to the Rice Hotel and the traffic just stopped and people got all, all over the place. So there we started into the Rice Hotel. That's myself on the left. I don't know what I'm doing with my hand. <laughs> and Mrs. White, Mrs. President, Mrs. Uh, Kennedy, and Mrs. Johnson on the right-hand side. So then in the, within the hotel, there was a group having a meeting called the LULAC group, which was the Hispanic group. And so we went there, and President Kennedy introduced, or tried to talk to the people. Then he turned and introduced Mrs. Kennedy to the crowd. And she spoke to them in Spanish. And the place just erupted with applause. And when she finished, then Vice President Johnson was to give some remarks. And he simply stood up and said, uh, I think everything has been said that needs to be said. <laughs> couldn't follow that. <laughs> we then went over to the Coliseum for a testimonial dinner to Congressman Albert Thomas, who had brought this aerospace industry to Houston, Texas. 
They were honoring him that night. Got back on Air Force One and flew over to Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth. Got in there pretty late at night. It was raining lightly. And we then traveled down to the Hotel Texas in Fort Worth. So here we're trying to get into the hotel. You see the president there. And I'm, I'm near, right behind Mrs. Kennedy. Right behind me is Rufus Youngblood. And behind him is Vice President Johnson. And so we had to fight our way through this crowd of thousands of people trying to get into the hotel in Fort Worth. So that was the first day. All of that took place November 21st. So then Friday, November 22nd, you wake up and you're in Fort Worth. And the first thing that happened was there were so many people who wanted to see and hear President Kennedy that we had to establish a, a, a special speech site outside the hotel in a parking lot. That was not on the original schedule. It had to be at. So it was raining lightly that morning, and President Kennedy came out with Vice President Johnson, Speaker Jim Wright, and he addressed the crowd there in the parking lot in the rain. And then he had to go into a breakfast within the hotel. So when he finished the breakfast in the hotel, he and Mrs. Kennedy would be going through the streets of Fort Worth, back to Air Force One at Carswell Air Force Base. And you can see the people that turned out. The city, they had turned out the schools, permitted the students to get let out and go see this, uh, see the president, Mrs. Kennedy, and Vice President, Mrs. Johnson. They put some of their high school band at various intersections. It was a real carnival atmosphere as we traveled through the city. It was a remarkably large, exuberant, and friendly crowd. There was hardly no negativity whatsoever. So now you're going to, let me get this straight, fly from Fort Worth to Dallas. <laughs> Didn't make much sense to us either, believe me. <laughs> but the political people wanted a photograph of President and Mrs. Kennedy coming off the rear of Air Force One in Dallas at Love Field. And so it took us longer to taxi on both ends of the flight than it did to fly. So we did that, and Mrs. Kennedy and the President come off the rear of Air Force One to be greeted by Vice President and Mrs. Johnson, who they just saw 10 minutes before, in <laughs> Fort Worth. So they then went through the receiving line, went out, the President decided to want to shake hands with the crowd by the fence. Mrs. Kenny went along with it, which was somewhat unusual for her to do. She, she didn't really like to do that kind of thing, but she knew that she was going to have to just support him in his 1964 bid for the election. Press were going crazy with the photographers getting up on anything that they could get up on. They were having a field day. We worked our way down the line of the crowds and got back, got into SS 100X, which, which had, had been flown from San Antonio now to Dallas. This car in the front seat are the driver Bill Greer and the supervisor Roy Kellerman. Governor Connolly seated sitting immediately in front of President Kennedy in what we call a jump seat. It folds from the front to the back. The back of that jump seat is right up against the President's knees. In front of Mrs. Kennedy was Nellie Connolly. You see that aluminum brace that runs across the top of the car, which is the front attachment for a bubble top if you were going to use it. And that makes it impossible for the agent who's in the right front seat to get into the back without getting out of the car. But that's the way that car was constructed. And we were instructed that there would be no bubble top, that it was to be an up close and personal trip into and around Texas, that they didn't want it to appear that there was anything between themselves and the people who were going to vote. And Clint, the reason you were there on that trip is because Mrs. Kennedy was there. So your um, main protection was Mrs. Kennedy that day. Mrs. Kennedy was my responsibility, yes. So as you go into Dallas, what was the feeling like? Large crowds, so large they could not be contained on the sidewalk, extremely friendly, very exuberant, something that the politicals were hoping for, didn't think that would happen, but it did. They were very pleased. Governor yes. and Mrs. Connolly were pleased as well. So you were the Kennedys. See people hanging out of windows, um, open windows, and this is all along Main Street. This is what you saw all along the route. That's correct. So there you see, we're, we're 
driving down the street, and I'm, you see me, I'm on the back of the car now, and the reason I am is that the driver was keeping the car to the left-hand side of the street. The Ken President Kennedy was in the right rear. That kept him away from the crowd on the right-hand side. But that put Mrs. Kennedy right up next to the crowd on the left-hand side. So I would get off the follow-up car, which was right behind the President's car, and get up on top of the back of the presidential vehicle to be as close to Mrs. Kennedy in those situations as I could. And you'll notice the driver has now opened his door to use as a wedge to keep people back away from the car. So this was all along Main Street, and then as you came upon this area known as Dealey Plaza, the motorcade was really almost over at this point, and then the crowds dropped off. So you weren't, you weren't on the back of the car at that I time. I was not on the back of the car. Some people have said, well, why didn't you go straight down Main Street? Because our, our destination was the trademark. We had to get on the Stemmons Freeway going toward the trademark. If we went straight down Main Street, there was a concrete barrier that prevented us from going right. And so we had to turn right on Houston, left on Elm, to get to that Stemmons Freeway going in the proper direction. Well, that put us right in front of the Texas School Book Depository. And you can see that turn there, that where they're going to make that left turn. It's a very sharp turn. So that meant the cars had to slow way down. Normally, we were running 10 to 12 miles per hour. The distance between the presidential car and the follow-up car under most conditions was about three feet. And in this con situation, we slowed down below 10 miles an hour briefly as we tried to make that turn onto Elm Street. This is the follow-up car. I'm in the front position on the running board. There's an agent behind me, two agents on the other side of the running board, two agents in the back of that car, one with a rifle. Two of President Kennedy's assistants are in the car, Kenny O'Donnell and Dave Powers, and then the driver and the supervisor in the front seat. So we're traveling down Elm Street. And notice the motorcycles right next to him on either side. As we were traveling down, I was looking over to the left toward a grassy area. And there were a few people there, and then I was looking straight ahead. There was a triple underpass we had to go under. There was a policeman up there, I noticed. And so all of a sudden, I hear this explosive noise over my right shoulder from the rear. I didn't recognize it as a gunshot initially, so I started to turn toward the noise to see what it was. And in doing so, my eyes passed across the back of the presidential car. Now the agents on the other side of the car were doing the same thing. They were turning to see if they could locate what this noise was. And the people in the crowd, if you noticed, many of them are looking up toward the Texas School Book Depository. They've come there to look at the president, but that's not what they're looking at. Because of the noise from the gunshot, they were looking up at the Texas School Book Depository. When I recognized it as a gunshot because I saw the president grab at his throat like this, and then he started to fall to his left, I knew then that it was a gunshot. I jumped off the car, started to run toward the presidential vehicle. My intention was to get up on the back and form a shield there to protect both President and Mrs. Kennedy. I had to negotiate my way between a motorcycle officer and the car I was on. There was a lot of engine noise. I didn't hear the second shot. The agents told me later there was one while I was running. The noise from the engines prevented me from hearing that. When I got close to the presidential vehicle, there was another shot. President Kennedy at that time, his head had gone down, his chin was on his chest, he was leaning up against Mrs. Kennedy's face, and the shot hit him back here. But it erupted right here out of this portion of his head. It was a real eruption of blood, bone fragments, brain tissue, and that material got all over the back of the car, all over me, all over Mrs. Kennedy. She then came up on the trunk. She tried to grab some of that material that had come out of the president's head, and she did get a hold of some of it. When I got up there, I grabbed her and put her in the back seat. When I got her into the back seat, the president's body fell to its left. 
Now his head was in her lap. Right side of his face was up. I could see his eyes were fixed. There was a hole in the skull. I could see there was no brain tissue in that area whatsoever. I thought it was a fatal wound. I turned and gave a thumbs down to the follow-up car crew to tell them how serious it was. Screamed at the driver to get us to a hospital. Chief Curry from Dallas got in front of us in a lead car and led us to Parkland Hospital. And you can see the position Clint is in. They were racing down Stemmons Freeway at speeds of 70 to 80 miles per hour as he was in this position. Now, there were only three shots. He didn't know there were only going to be three shots. He fully expected more were coming and he kept his body in this position, the four minute horrifying ride to Parkland Hospital. So what, what happened when you arrived at Parkland? When we got to Parkland, uh, we had a difficult time because we had to remove uh, Governor Connolly from the car first because of the way he was seated in the car. We couldn't do anything for the president before we removed Governor Connolly. We got him up on a gurney. They rushed him into the emergency room and put him in trauma room two. Then we were gonna try and help the president. So I, Mrs. Kennedy had a hold of him and she wouldn't let go. I said, please Mrs. Kennedy, let us help the president. I got no response at all. I pleaded with her again. Nothing. Then I realized I'd been with her now for a little over three years. I knew her pretty well. And I thought, well, she doesn't want anybody to see the condition the president is in, because it was deplorable. So I took off my suit coat, covered up his head, his upper back. As soon as I did that, she let go. We lifted him up, put him on a gurney, and rushed him into trauma room one. As Soon as we got him in there, doctors came from all over the hospital to do what they could for him. But by one o'clock, they said, uh, we're sorry, the president is dead. And meantime, you had opened a phone line to the White House. I'd been instructed to call the White House by my supervisor to let make sure they, our officers knew exactly what was happening. I told the operator to keep the line open. I was talking to my senior supervisor, Gerald Bain, and the operator cut in and said, uh, Mr. Hill, the Attorney General wants to talk to you. I said, okay. So I said, yes, Mr. Attorney General. He said, Clint, he said, what's going on down there? So I explained to him that both the governor and the president had been shot, that we were at Parkland Hospital. The doctors were doing everything they could. He said, well, how bad is it? I did not want to tell Bobby Kennedy that his brother was dead. So I said, it's as bad as it can get. And as soon as I said that, he hung up the phone and he knew the condition of his brother. So then Clint, you were charged with getting a casket and you and the other agents then loaded that casket onto Air Force One. Correct, we did. We took the casket up to Air Force One, the rear door, the Air Force crew had removed seats from the rear of the Air Force One so we could place it there. We had a problem when we got to the door with the handles on, you see the big handles there. It was just a little bit too wide, so we had to rip and tear at the handles until we got them off in order to get the casket inside Air Force One. Then Vice President and Mrs. Johnson were on board. They had been conferring with Washington, and they'd, the decision had been made that they would, he would be sworn in as president while we were still on the ground in Dallas. We were told that required a federal judge they located Sarah Hughes, who was brought on board to do that. Mrs. Kennedy, meantime, was in the next room, sitting by the presidential casket. She sent word to me, I was in the forward portion of Air Force One, that she wanted to see me. So I went back through the presidential compartment to where she was seated. She stood up, she grabbed my hand, and she said, oh, Mr. Hill, what's gonna happen to you now? And I said, I'll be okay, Mrs. Kennedy, I'll be okay. She was concerned about how I was reacting as well as the other agents because she knew how much we thought of the president. So then Mrs. Kennedy went to stand by as Vice President Johnson took the oath of office and became president of the United States. She had not changed clothes and she had not cleaned up because she said she wanted the people to see what had been done. And you were there 
I'm standing in the doorway behind Lem Johns and uh, Roy Kellerman and a witness to this swearing-in ceremony. So then um, Clint was on that long flight back to Washington, D.C. He arrived around 6 o'clock that evening. We arrived at Andrews, the Cessna Naval Hospital, sent an ambulance out there for us to transport the President's casket in. The Air Force had put a hydraulic lift there at the rear aircraft so we would have an easier time of moving the casket, which was extremely heavy, from the doorway down to the level of the uh, ambulance. Pre Mrs. Kennedy was joined by Robert Kennedy there uh, on Air Force One to make that trip by vehicle to Bethesda Naval Hospital. Meanwhile, President Mrs. Johnson exited the aircraft and President Johnson spoke for the first time since the assassination as the president just outside of Air Force One there at Andrews Air Force Base. So for the next four days, the world basically stopped as people tried to understand what had gone on. Nobody could believe this. And on November 25th, 1963, was the funeral for President John F. Kennedy. And Mrs. Kennedy had indicated she wanted to walk behind the caisson during the cortege movement and the funeral. I was very concerned about the security matters that involved because of the numbers of people that were going to be there. There were going to be over about 100 visiting heads of state. And I finally convinced her that maybe she should have shortened the distance she was walking. So she only walked from the White House to St. Matthews on up Pennsylvania Avenue. And that's what you see here. It's Robert Kennedy, Mrs. Kennedy, and Teddy Kennedy in the front row. It's myself on the left, her uh, half-brother, Jamie, Sergeant Shriver, Steve Smith, her brother-in-law, and another agent. And then you see President and Mrs. Johnson, Lucy and Linda. And there on the, on the left is Agent Livingood, Agent Youngblood, Agent Thompson, Boring, Bain, and Kivett on the right. We then started to walk, and behind us came about 100 plus heads of state that were there, including Charles de Gaulle, Queen Frederica of Greece, King Baudouin of Belgium, Crown Prince Harold of Norway, Prince Philip from the Great Britain, and Haile Selassie, the Emperor of Ethiopia. Those were just a few of the names. All walking through the streets of Washington, D.C., the president had just been assassinated. It was a security nightmare. After the services, former presidents Truman and Eisenhower, who attended the services, came out and came up to the vehicle that Mrs. Kennedy was in to express their condolences. I'm standing there on the left as they both talked with Mrs. Kennedy. That's Margaret Truman behind her father. And then we took the body to Arlington National Cemetery for the burial. And it was getting toward evening as the ceremony concluded at Arlington National Cemetery. So Clint, um, what happened to you then after the assassination? I was ordered to remain with Mrs. Kennedy uh, by the president. And then a new legislation was passed creating protection for Mrs. Kennedy for life or until she remarried, and for the children until they re reached the age of 16. So I was sent with, to be with Mrs. Kennedy and remained with her for a year. She moved to New York. And just in October of 64, we were in New York. President Johnson was campaigning, and he came to the city of New York City. Robert Kennedy was running for the US Senate from New York. And they came to see Mrs. Kennedy at a residence, 1045th Avenue. That's myself in the middle as they uh, bid farewell that day. So then, in right after the election, what happened to you? November of 1964, I was transferred from Mrs. Kennedy to the White, back to the White House and became part of the White House detail assigned to President Johnson. So what was that transition like, going from Jacqueline Kennedy to LBJ? Well, it was, it was considerably different. It was a different type personality, different type activity, uh, completely different. It wasn't, we weren't going to Cape Cod, we were going to the LBJ Ranch in Johnson City, Texas. 
And here we are at the LBJ Ranch, as it looked at one time, early in the administration. See the house there with the pool? That's a hangar up back in the background. That White House turned out to be our security house. But it became this as a, after the transformation. The buildings painted that army green, I guess you'd call it. There's some of it is uh, White House Communications Agency, communications equipment and personnel, ready personnel capability for Air Force pilots because we had a jet star on standby there. We also had helicopters there. We had to have helicopter crews and maintenance personnel there. And then we had our own agents there. We had to have fire department equipment because of the aircraft. So it was quite an operation there at the LBJ Ranch. So um, like President Eisenhower had said, he was always on time and everything. What, um, what was LBJ's personality like in that respect? Well, he had a belief that if he didn't tell anybody what he was going to do, nobody could do him harm. And so a lot of times, we didn't have a clue what he was going to do, <laughs> such as this. One day, the valet, or the Air Force steward, comes out of the house. He's got a hang-up bag and a little uh, suitcase. Now, we knew the valet wasn't going anywhere. That meant the president was. So the Jetstar crew ran from the ready room out to get in the Jetstar, because we didn't know if we were going to fly to St. Louis, Detroit, or Houston. The helicopter flew, crew ran out to get in the helicopter, because we might be going into Austin. And the agents ran to get the cars ready because we might be going over to the Morrisons or maybe to the Lewis Ranch or up to the lake. We didn't know. We never knew, but you see back there the golf cart's coming. The president's in the golf cart. We didn't have much time to get ready to wherever we were going to go. <laughs> but that was rather typical. And the president, President Johnson, loved his ranch there in, along the Pertinalis River. So much so that he had press conferences on the front lawn. He would bring in heads of state and heads of government, but he'd also bring in members of the cabinet. Here you see the Secretary of Defense and the members of the Joint, Chief, Joint Chiefs of Staff conferring on the front lawn about the Defense Department budget for the next year. Or he might want to go, and then it was an everyday occurrence, twice a day we'd go out and drive through the various ranches to check the cattle. It was the dance, the Lewis, the Sharn Horse. We weren't sure where we were going, but we knew we were going to one of those ranches. He then he might want to go. That's one thing I learned writing this book is President Johnson loved to check on his cattle every day. He might want to go over to the lake. Because he went over to the lake, he would have guests. And he loved, when he had a female guest, to get her in this little car and drive her around, and all of a sudden go down a ramp right into the lake while she screamed, help, we're going to drown. He's saying, I don't have any brakes. <laughs> and, and this happened to be President Kennedy's sister, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, in, in this particular situation. That's Paul Glenn, one of the Air Force stewards that worked with President Johnson in the back. But it was all in good fun. Everybody had a good time. <laughs> So then, Clint, um, you were there during the inauguration as well. This is in 1965. That's me on the right rear of the car. That car, by the way, is the same car that was used in Dallas that President Kennedy was riding in when he was assassinated. Shortly after the assassination, the car was returned to the Ford Motor Company. It was completely enclosed with armor and bullet-resistant glass. And so that's what we used in the inauguration parade in 1965. But then President Johnson had a way around that. Yes, we'd go out, and he wanted to be among the people. So he'd either get on top of the car or just stand in the doorway. Anything to be among the people. So this, this was very Honolulu, typical. Honolulu, and I don't know if you can see Clint is back there in the I'm, back. Seat. I'm back there what, in the follow. What are you thinking? Well, I'm back in the follow-up car, saying, "Come on, get back in the car." <laughs> so this is a typical operation. Then we went down to Australia, and we had some great reception, but some not so friendly. In one case, they started throwing balloons filled with paint, and that's Rufus Youngblood in the back covered in paint, 
Lem Johns on the left front. It was so bad that the agents had to go to the hospital to make sure their eyes were cleansed so they didn't have to, they didn't suffer any permanent damage. But all while this was going on, out in front of the White House and almost every place we went, there were demonstrators, anti-war demonstrators, across the street in front of Lafayette Park, demonstrators, along the, the uh, reflecting pool between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument, demonstrators, over at the Pentagon, demonstrators. No matter where we went, there were demonstrators. It became a real problem. He became pretty good friends with this gentleman on the left, Prime Minister Harold Holt of Australia. In December of 1967, we got word that Prime Minister Holt had drowned while swimming in the ocean off of Australia. And Clint, by this point, um, what, where were you in your career? I had been appointed special agent in charge of presidential protection. And so President Johnson decided he wanted to go down to Australia for the funeral. So we flew down to Australia. Now we were pretty aware that this wasn't just going to be a funeral trip. There were very few people who knew exactly what the trip was going to entail. Jim Cross, the pilot, he knew. Rufus Youngbud, he knew from the Secret Service point of view. And Jack Valenti knew pretty much because he was the contact with what turned out to be the Pope. So what happened was, after the funeral, we took off from, uh, we were in Cam Canberra. We took off, but we didn't head back to the United States. We headed toward Thailand. We landed in Darwin and refueled and flew on into Karat Air Force Base in Thailand. President Johnson wanted to debrief some of the pilots who had just came in from a bombing run over Vietnam. This is what they did. From Karat, we flew down to Comrade Bay in Vietnam. That's President Johnson and General Westmoreland on the back of that Jeep, and that's myself in the dark suit behind them as they trooped the line. Then President Johnson wanted to go in and shake hands with the troops. He would ask them where they were from, how long they'd been there. Uh, he wanted to make sure they understood he cared. So then, from there, we flew over to Karachi, Thailand, because the president wanted to meet with President Ayub Khan. So we met him there in a hangar near the air, air, air strip and uh, spent a, uh, just a few, about an hour and a half there. Uh, at one point, President Johnson turned to me and said, Clint, he said, get the president here some refreshments. So I had the stewards from Air Force One come and find out what they wanted. and They were able to provide them with some beverages. Uh, but then we took off from Karachi, and we flew to Rome. President Johnson wanted to see the President of Italy and the Pope. So when that concluded, we got back on Air Force One. We were going to head back to the United States. So this had been like to all in 24 hours or something, or two A little more days. than that, but it wasn't much more than that. It was. And you had barely slept. I hadn't slept hardly at all, nor had any agents. So between the time we took off from Rome and the next stop was gonna be the Azores to refuel, President Johnson, when he got on board in Rome, put on his pajamas, went to bed in the presidential suite. So when we were airborne, I laid down myself to get a little nap. Jim Cross, the pilot, had radioed ahead to the commander of the Air Force Base in the Azores and asked them to keep the post exchange open because it was now Christmas Eve and nobody on the aircraft had been able to do any Christmas shopping. And so we were going to stop there to refuel and he asked him to keep the PX open. So the president is in this Sweet sleeping. We land. They bring up a couple Air Force buses. Everybody gets off the plane and gets in the buses. I told them I'd stay there with the president, go on and go shopping. So I'm down at the foot of the ramp, walking back and forth. Thought the president was up there sleeping. All of a sudden, he said, hey, Clint, where is everybody? <laughs> 
I said, well, Mr. President, you know it is Christmas Eve. They've opened the PX and they've gone to the PX to buy some Christmas presents for their families. I said, well, I haven't been shopping either. Let's go. <laughs> now he's standing up there in his yellow pajamas. He's got his slippers on, reaches back in a closet, pulls out a trench coat, puts that on, comes walking down the steps. I grabbed an Air Force driver in the car, put him in the back seat. Way to the post exchange we go. Get to the PX, walk in there, open the door. You could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> Nobody in there could believe. The commander in chief of the United States Armed Forces, the leader of the free world is walking around in the middle of the night in his pajamas buying Christmas presents. <laughs> Lucky for him, the press had gone on to Shannon to refuel. They never caught a picture. So that was the end of 1967, and then we go into 1968, which was quite a year. Yes, it was. The end of March 1968, I'd gone home. I knew the president was going to make a speech from the Oval Office. Didn't have to stay there for that, so I was home, had my TV on, listening to the speech. He got to the last line. He said, I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. I almost fell out of my chair. I had no idea he was gonna do that. Here he was, he had been the leader of the Senate. He had been the Vice President of the United States. And now he was President of the United States. And he was giving that up. Why? Well, one of the reasons was he did some things you don't, aren't aware of probably. In the middle of the night, he'd get up, he'd pick up the phone, call the Situation Room, and have them give him the numbers. How many killed, how many wounded. He kept that every night. It was really starting to get to him. Then once in a while, he'd have us take him to a Catholic church down on Main Avenue, where Lucy, had gone to church. And he'd go in and he'd sit and talk to the monks. Didn't stay there long, but it gave him a chance to just talk to them. He knew that they'd never say anything. And the Vietnam situation was bothering him so much, I think it became a major reason why he decided not to run again in 1968. So then four days after this speech, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Yes. He was assassinated in Memphis, and we learned about it immediately. And as you see here, is, uh, the president is there, and he's probably on the phone with J. Edgar Hoover trying to find out as much information as he could, as members of the staff are, are watching the reports on the three TV uh, sets that were in the Oval Office. Now, and that night, you went home, and in the middle of the night, you got a phone call. Yes, about two in the morning, phone rang. I had a phone right next to my bed, direct line to the White House switchboard. And it rang, so I knew it was the president or really something really urgent, so I picked it up and it was the president. He said, Clint, he said, uh, you know, we're going to that memorial service out at National Cathedral for King tomorrow. I said, yes, Mr. President, we're all ready. He said, look, he said, I want you to keep the car as close to the arrival door as you possibly can and I want you to stay as close to me as white on rice all through the services. And so that's what I did. Here you see us coming out. That's me immediately behind him. Those are other senior agents on either side. I see Tom Johnson there behind Bob Taylor. This was the services for Dr. King. And he was, he was nervous at that point, anxious. He was concerned that this could happen to him what happened to Dr. King. And then just two months later, Robert Kennedy was assassinated and you got another middle of the night phone call. Yes, notified that he had been killed and immediately President Johnson contacted Rufus Youngblood, directed that all candidates that were running for the office of president be protected immediately. And he later signed a document authorizing that protection 
which became law and is still in effect today as we stood there and watched him sign uh, that declaration. So then Richard Nixon won his party's nomination for, for the presidency in 1968. Yes, and so the, President Johnson thought he would be a good gesture to invite President Nixon to come down to the ranch and he could brief him there. So they set a date and he flew down to the ranch, brought with him Vice President nominee Agnew, Dick Helms, the head of the CIA, uh, the press secretary to President Nixon, or then nominee Nixon, President Johnson, Ambassador uh, Cyrus Vance, Bob Haldeman, Jim Jones, Tom Johnson, and Secretary of State Dean Rusk enjoying a lunch and laughing at some remark the president had just made. <laughs> then he wanted to take Richard Nixon out and sit and talk to him one-on-one -on -one just outside the ranch house. Now I want you to notice the clothing that President Johnson is wearing. These are his ranch clothes. Now that day after Nixon and his staff left the ranch, Clint, you received a package. I'd received a package that morning and I opened it up and, and it was a pair of clothes, a set of clothes, a shirt and a pair of pants. And I wasn't too sure, you know, it was from the president, but didn't know quite why. And so I just put them back in a package and so we went through the day. Nixon and Agnew get on the plane and leave and I went back to the command center and phone rings. President Johnson, he said, uh, Clint, he said, did you get that package I sent you? I said, yes, Mr. President, it's a wonderful set of clothes. I thank you very much. He said, no, and he said, I want to see you in them. He said, you put them on. I'm out here at the pool. You come walking out here. I want to see what it looks like. <laughs> so I put them on, walked out by the pool. You see the presence in the pool. That's one of his... Uh, Air Force stewards there as I stood there and modeled them. Now, if you don't think it was embarrassing for me to put those clothes on in the command center where all the agents were, you know, it was. But they were very, very high quality, nice clothes. It was a set of ranch clothes. They really like were. And so, and it, so did you wear those around the ranch? I didn't want to get them dirty, so I didn't wear them. <laughs> Did you ever get the Johnson treatment? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you all know what this is. I had a sore is. breastbone from the Johnson treatment because he loved to get up close and personal, even closer than that. Now, here he's telling me a story, so that was fun. But if he had something that was very serious on his mind, and occasionally I didn't even know what he was talking about. And he would get up really close, and then he'd start this. And, oh, it hurt. But it gave him relief. And that was fine. So I, you just stand and take it. So then uh, Richard Nixon was elected president. Once again, Clint was not assigned to the president. You happened to be assigned to the vice president. They came to me and said, you know, Clint, he said, uh, you were assigned to the Kennedys. You worked with the Johnsons. We don't think you're gonna get along with the Nixons. I said, I think you got that right. So they said, here's what we wanna do. We wanna make you the agent in charge of vice presidential protection. And I said, okay. So we made some changes in staffing, required that the vice president have a dedicated aircraft, required that the vice president have a dedicated physician, required a certain number of agents, on the detail, and uh, they agreed to all that, and so that's how that detail began. And so there, you were with Spiro Agnew for about a year, and you got to do some fun things. We went down for the, the launch of the manned space shuttle to the moon. There we are, I'm there with Vice President Mrs. Agnew, there's Vice President, or then pre former President Mrs. Johnson, and there right behind President Johnson is Tom Johnson, who was seated there in the front row, enjoying that launch vehicle shot. So quickly tell us, what was uh, Nixon like in comparison? Well, we knew him as a vice president, but when he came back as a president sworn in in 1969, he was a different person. 
he, everybody who runs for office is really happy about getting that Oval Office, and that's where they sit and they work and they love it. Nixon established an office over an executive office building across the street. He spent as much time there as he did in the Oval Office. For some reason, he liked to be alone, and that's where he would meet and, and discuss things with people. So then in 1972, one middle of the night, I get a phone call. It's the intelligence division informing me that there'd been a break-in at Democratic National Committee headquarters. They'd made some arrests. So I said, well, what's that got to do with us? They said, well, we're not sure, but here are the names of the people that were arrested. So they read off, none, two, three, four. They got to the fifth name and they said, James McCord. I thought, well, gee, name is somewhat familiar. I'm not sure. Okay, thanks very much. So I waited so that early that next morning, about eight o'clock, I thought I would call the deputy director who was close with the Nixon staff. His name was Pat Boggs. So I called and told Boggs what had happened. And then I started to read off the names and I got to, I said, Jim McCord, and all I could hear was this profanity at the end of the phone. I knew I'd struck a chord that there was something going on. Then I remembered who he was, former CIA agent. Specialty was in eavesdropping and bugging. And we knew him very well. And at that time, he was employed by an agency we referred to as CREEP, Committee to Re-elect the President. He was working for President Nixon and the Republican Party. So things started to unravel. And then separately, Vice President Agnew resigned. Ultimately, Nixon resigned and Gerald R. Ford became president, and you were there during that transition as well. Yes, on this morning, on August 9th, uh, President Nixon made a speech in the East Room to his staff uh, saying goodbye, then they came out on the South Grounds to get on a helicopter, and uh, Nixon walked up the steps and he gave it the usual, and I was standing in the back and I said to myself, I said, what the hell does he think he's won? He's leaving in disgrace. But that was just the way he was. So then President Ford took the oath of office and uh, made a speech in the East Room in which he said, uh, our national nightmare is over. And for all intents and purposes, it was. So then the first trip that President Ford made was to Chicago, outside the city of Washington. He went to the for the VFW National Convention there in Chicago. And so I went along, I wanted to see how the agents on the detail were getting along with he and his staff. And I found out it was, they were doing an excellent job, but it was very enjoyable to see this gentleman as he was uh, really well received by the VFW there in Chicago. So then in July of 1975, in the middle of President Ford's administration, Clint retired from the Secret Service. Uh, he was 43 years old. Clint, I know you said that originally growing up in Washburn, North Dakota, you never had any intention of being a Secret Service agent. You wanted to be a history teacher. Well, as it turned out, you have become a wonderful history teacher. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. We would like to have any questions that you have. There's, speak, there's uh, microphones in the aisle. Please use them. We have Take a few about minutes. 10 minutes of questions. So if you want to just come up to the microphone. Walk over in to the, the microphone, and it doesn't matter what the question is. I think I've heard them all. <laughs> Glenn, I'll, I'll be very brief so others have time. Lisa, President Kennedy loved history. But I majored in history and ended up a registered nurse. Okay, my father, I found out after you talked, he was in that children's home a lot before you were. Remember, he's from Wapiton, I told you. Anyway, Lisa, 
If it wasn't for you, this history would have been lost. That would have been the most, think of the tragedy of not having what he saw, what he thought, what he experienced. Thank you. I was, in, I was a corpsman in Vietnam, I came under fire. When you were, when those shots rang out, you had no clue how many were going to come. You just reacted. I saw the ground when it happened to me, but you reacted. You saved probably Mrs. Kennedy. Thank God you weren't hurt. If God wanted to take President Kennedy, at least he didn't take you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hill, could you talk about the visit from uh, Elvis Presley? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, one, I was at the, in headquarters at the time. I was assistant director. One day, my secretary came running in. She said, Mr. Hill, you're not going to believe this. Elvis Presley just showed up at the Northwest Gate. He wants to see the president. <laughs> I said, did he have an appointment? And they said, no, he doesn't have an appointment. He just wants to see him. I said, well, you've got to turn him away. <laughs> you know? Well, OK. So then they said, one of the guys that was working there said, we better let the staff know. So they notified the president's staff that Elvis had showed up. Well, they said, oh, this is the opportunity. So let's get a hold of him. He was staying at the Hotel Washington, I think it was. So they got in touch with him and they had him come over and he went in to see the president. Then he brought a gift, a gun. <laughs> he wanted to give the president a gun. So we had to take the gun away and examine it and all that kind of stuff. But there he was, and they took photographs, and you'll see him. It's a very popular photograph of Nixon and Elvis Presley in the Oval Office. But I mean, it was one of those things that uh, just had to be there to believe it. <laughs> Nobody else has a question? Well, we got maybe one here. Um, uh, can you get a microphone? Here's a gentleman here. Yes, sir. Did you keep in touch with any of the people you were protected after you left? Uh, I kept, Mrs. Kennedy and I kept in touch a little bit. She, when I left, she would phone me periodically, usually because there was a problem with the agents who were uh, dealing with the children. And so we would discuss it and how I'd get it resolved for her. But I, last time I ever saw or talked with her was at Robert Kennedy's funeral in 1968. That was the last time. I have seen Caroline a couple times since then. But, you know, we're not social friends or anything. I'm curious, and this may be too personal, but how do you have a personal life when you've dedicated your life to these? Well, you, you don't, <laughs> really. Uh, in 1963, I think it was that summer, a number of the agents requested transfers away from the White House detail because the travel was just too much and their wives were just about fed up and they were gonna file for divorce. For myself, I was gone about 90% of the time. I was never there for my children's birthdays, any of the holidays. And so they pretty much grew up without a father. Their mother really raised them. Fortunately for me, my two sons and I are closer now than ever. But it was a long time before that really occurred. It was a, it's very difficult under the conditions that were limited for us at that time to maintain a family and have that kind of job. Um, after the assassination in Dallas, I imagine that you would have had to take some sort of personal time. Um, were you allowed any time away from post or did you choose to take it or not take it? We were not given any counseling. I can give you my schedule. The assassination occurred on the 22nd. We brought the president's body back to the White House at 4.30 in the morning on the 23rd. Six o'clock in the morning on the 23rd, I went home, showered, shaved, changed clothes, came back to work because the agents had been with, Mrs. with President Kennedy, were now with President Johnson. That left the two agents that had originally been assigned, myself and one other, with Mrs. Kennedy, the three agents who were with the children, with the children, and a few agents from the Washington field office to supplement us at midnight. But other than that, we, I had no, we had no days off for the foreseeable future, and we spent some time, a lot of time away from Washington. 
We left uh, that week. We, the funeral was on the 25th, which is a Monday. It was also with John F. Kennedy Jr.'s birthday, by the way. Third birthday. The 27th was Caroline's birthday. The 28th was Thanksgiving. And we flew to Cape Cod so Mrs. Kennedy could brief her in-laws. Came back to Washington, moved him out of the White House on December 6th to a house in Georgetown owned by Averill Harriman. He, moved, he and his wife moved out, left their staff, just let her have the house with the kids. Then we took Mrs. Kenny and the children to Florida where they spent Christmas and New Year's. So we didn't have any time for ourselves at all. Yes, sir. Mr. Health, it's not a fair question, but I'm gonna ask you, which president are you most fond of? <laughs> well, you know, I get, that, I get that asked all the time, and I you really don't. Answer. Yeah, yeah. I really don't have a favorite. Uh, each one of them, are, they're so different. The one thing that all five of the presidents I worked with had in common was a large ego. It's not as large as some egos <laughs> at present, <laughs> but it, it was large, and, but they had different mannerisms, different likes, different lists likes. They were just completely different people. And I got along better with some than others, but I didn't have a favorite, really. I really asked who you were most fond of, but I'm going to let it go and just say, what a great opportunity to be able to be fond of presidents the way you were. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Hill, is it your belief that Lee Harvey Oswald was the sole assassin of President John F. Kennedy? In my opinion, based on all the data I've seen, and I've seen a lot, there were only three shots fired in Dealey Plaza that day. They all came from the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository, fired out of one rifle that they was located there, hidden behind some boxes when the police went in to that area. They found three spent shell casings on the floor of what we call the sniper's nest. All that material was traced back to an individual who had used a phony name in acquiring these items. The rifle was purchased in a mail order house in Chicago, sent to this address in Dallas, and it turned out to be an alias that Lee Harvey Oswald always used and had used many times before. In my opinion, there was one assassin. He operated alone. His name was Lee Harvey Oswald. Thank you very much. Let's take one final question, if we may, please. Last but not least. So, Mr. Hill, I'm curious. After the assassination, have you ever returned to the point of Dallas where it occurred? I went back to Dallas in 1990 for the first time. Alone. Walked the area of Dealey Plaza, went up to in the... Texas School Book Depository to the sixth floor, looked out that window, because I really needed to see exactly what we had faced. I checked everything, the wind that day, the angles, the car, everything, the elevation, and I came away knowing that there was nothing more I could have done that day than what I did do, that it was just one of those things that happens that we didn't have a chance. He had all the advantages we didn't have any. He was shooting us from behind. We couldn't see him. Uh, there was just not much we could do. Uh, but it really affected me because we had a responsibility to protect the president, and we failed to do so. And so it, I had that sense of guilt that we hadn't performed our duty, and I was brought up by a family that's the one thing you do, if you're given a job to do, you carry it out to the end result, or you never quit. And uh, so it just haunted me for years and years and years. It wasn't until I actually talked with Lisa McCubbin, and she got me to really unload, start to talk about that day and the events surrounding it, that I got to feel better. And that was in 2009, that was 46 years after the event occurred. Let me just once again thank Lisa, thank Clint. Lisa, if you walk over, please, uh, for what is, I think, just an extraordinary perspective of history, perhaps that nobody else could possibly put together. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you.